there is definitely the possibility that life on Earth is an immigrant phenomenon. Um, mm -hmm. This has been believed by some uh, for a long time um, because one mystery about life on Earth is that there are no examples of free-living organisms on Earth that are simpler than bacteria, and bacteria are already extremely complex. So it's like here in America, there's no example of uh, European architecture that can be found that predates the Renaissance. Um, so you don't find genuine classical architecture in America or Bronze mm -hmm. Age architecture or so forth. Um, so because Western culture in the Americas is an immigrant phenomenon. Okay. Uh, is life on Earth an immigrant phenomenon? And if so, did it come from Mars? Uh, you might find that out by finding life on Mars that uses the same biochemistry as Earth life, but also including some more primitive um, exemplars. Uh, and then that would tell you much more about the origin of life than you can learn by studying life on Earth. Just mm -hmm. like if you want to study the origin of Western civilization, you can't do it by studying architecture found in North America. You got to go mm -hmm. to Europe. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 uh, where the prior versions of Western civilizations existed. Um, and um, so then you could, but in either way, whether we're finding a separate genesis um, or a prior genesis, you're finding out a lot more about what life is as opposed to you know, it, it, once again, it's like language. If you only know English, you think English is language. If you are acquainted with a large variety of languages, especially ones substantially different, you'd have a much broader concept of linguistics. Mm. Yeah. Um, Robert, I know I've taken up a lot of your time already, but if you have time, uh, people on Twitter had quite a few questions for you, and I'd like let's to take a, a couple let's of Let's take a few of them. You. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Stephen Fleming, who is a friend of mine and very heavily involved in uh, space research, um, and he asks, we've done, very li we've done very nearly zero research on human physiology at one-third gravity. How much is enough to do in a low-orbit centrifuge near Earth, for example, before sending humans to live in one-third G for months or years? Well, that's an interesting question. Um... Look, it'd be great, and I am an advocate of flying uh, artificial gravity satellites with animals and even people to learn more about one-third gravity health effects. However, I have to say that a human expedition to Mars, um, the risk of health effects due to one-third gravity uh, you know, we're talking first about exploration missions here, where you're going to go to Mars for a year and a half and come back, uh, would rate pretty low on my list of potential risks to the mission. Um, so, you know, if you're willing to risk flying to Mars, uh, you're going to be willing to risk enduring one, a year and a half in one-third gravity. Um, the The... I did once ask Buzz Aldrin, who of course has experienced Earth gravity, zero gravity, and lunar gravity, uh, how did he perceive lunar gravity? Did it seem more like being on Earth or like being in space? And he said, like Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there's an up, there's a down, the fluids in the body go to the right places instead of puffing up your head and doing all this stuff that, so that there's every reason to believe that one-third gravity is even more like Earth than lunar gravity, uh, and that um, any health effects from experiencing one-third gravity would be certainly less severe than those from zero gravity. And we've had people in zero gravity for as long as a year and a half. Um, now, it does. Zero gravity does weaken people um, unless they very strenuously work out. Um, I think it'd be logical to conclude that one-third gravity might tend to weaken you a bit because you're not don't have the same stress as you get from walking around in um, one gravity, but not as much as zero gravity where you're just floating all over the place. Um, 
So, um, and now uh, a more interesting question will be, uh, before we have children on, how do we know about the developmental aspects of uh, human um, development um, it, if the mother is living in one-third gravity? Uh, well, by the time there are people born on Mars, there will have been people who've been exploring Mars for a long time. They'll probably have labs on Mars where they could see how uh, mammals develop in one-third gravity. So we'll have some data to support that question. Uh, to support an answer to that question. Uh, I suspect it'll be fine because um, the infant inside of the mother's womb is living in zero gravity now because it's living in a buoyant environment. Um, the, the, now, the development of children after they're born, uh, I think um, they would have to be encouraged to engage in active athletic sports and so forth in order to make sure that their muscles and so forth develop well. Uh, I think, however, that people born and raised on Mars, while they might be capable of coming to Earth, won't like to. Because mm -hmm. I think they'll find the gravity here extremely unpleasant. And they'll mm -hmm. wonder why anyone would want to live here. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a recurrent theme in, in sci-fi depictions. Yeah, sure. Certainly it's a major part of the plot in The Expanse. And also more recently in the Orville, um, where there's a crew member who's from a planet with much, uh, uh, with much higher gravity, um, and on board the at Earth normal gravity, she loses so much strength that she's not comfortably able to go home. Um, um, yeah, that that is um, that that certainly seems like um, a pro a kind of ongoing issue to be solved. I don't want to call it a problem because I'm quite. Uh, optimistic about people's eventual ingenuity in solving um, in solving problems. 